Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thanks first to Lisa Smith for inviting me um, once again to a Natria's uh, conference. I've been coming to these fairly regularly since 1981, I think, when I first joined the association. Uh, definitely one of my favorites. So today I'm going to talk about, well, I'm going to use Florida as, as a case study and something of a personal story of why it's important to protect both small natural areas as well as large semi-natural landscapes. And so these are my main points, and I promise this is my only bullet slide of the entire talk. <laughs> and in fact, these, these take-home lessons um, basically are, are all you really need to know. The following slides are really just serve to embellish uh, these lessons. Uh, first, I've already said, uh, both small and large, natural and semi-natural areas are important if we want to conserve biodiversity. They serve different purposes. Um, especially in uh, the East, um, relatively pristine or high quality natural areas are usually small. They're often um, isolated, but they're absolutely critical for protecting rare species and rare natural community types. Large areas, landscapes on the other hand, are typically semi-natural, but they are critical in different ways. For example, for conserving populations of wide-ranging species and sustaining ecological processes or function. These strategies are complementary, not mutually exclusive. So whenever possible, we have to pursue both if we can. Now, as a prelude to my Florida story, I have to talk just a little bit about Ohio because my experiences in Ohio shaped what I want, went on to, um, to do and, uh, with my colleagues in Florida. Um, I cut my teeth in the natural race field in Ohio, uh, starting in the early 70s when I worked as a volunteer naturalist for the Ohio Historical Society, which, which at the time managed this area, where probably some of you have been because we had a Natural Rays Association field trip here um, a few years ago, Cedar Bog State Nature Preserve. Um, and after that, um, I worked a variety of jobs. I got a master's degree, and I, and I went on to work for the Ohio Heritage Program. And um, among other things, I was involved in setting up monitoring plots within Ohio State Nature Preserves. And having gone to graduate school and learned about island biogeographic theory and the problems of habitat fragmentation, uh, I began to get very concerned that um, Ohio's nature preserves, like in many states, especially in the east, were mostly small, isolated areas. And I was worried that these were not complete ecosystems. I was worried that they would not be able to maintain themselves as natural areas in the long term. They would suffer from edge effects, that they would lose species. So my boss at the time was uh, Bob McCants, um, whom many of you know, and Bob gave me a very interesting assignment. He said, Reed, what are we missing in natural areas conservation in Ohio? What can we do better? What can we do that's new and would complement what we've been doing already? So I apologize for this math. This is the only one I have of this little plan. But I went back. I said, well, you know, we're not maintaining entire ecosystems. So I propose that we recreate an Ohio Valley wilderness. We restore the great mixed mesophytic forest, the most species-rich deciduous forest in North America, and um, bring back populations of the wide-ranging species, beginning with fairly easy ones like otter and bobcat, moving up to black bear and perhaps beyond. Now, Bob McCants liked my um, plan, but it did not go over at all well with the higher levels of the Ohio Department of Natural Resources, who thought I'd wasted a lot of salary time coming up with this preposterous plan. So I ultimately was laughed out of Ohio. I quit my job um, and went to Florida. But in the meantime, the Nature Conservancy, um, Ohio's office, took an interest in this plan, especially in the landscape that I identified as the highest priority to start to connect preserves, bring them together, and beyond. And this was the Nature Conservancy in Cincinnati Museum's Edge of Appalachia Preserve System. And so when I proposed this grand scheme, uh, the Edge of Appalachia System was just a, a collection of small, isolated preserves. Over the years, they have been brought together and connected, as I suggested, eastward to the Shawnee State Forest. And thanks to um, the Nature Conservancy people there, Chris, Chris Beadle in particular, for sending me updates of their progress. 13,000 acres so far and still growing. 
And so I was in uh, Florida. I was working for the Florida Natural Areas Inventory and, and looking for a PhD advisor. And I found Dr. Larry Harris, professor at the University of Florida. And to my amazement, Larry had been working on very similar things as I was doing in Ohio. And he was proposing landscape linkages between large natural or semi-natural landscapes across the state of Florida. Um, the most famous one is an area called the Pinhook Swamp, which um, Larry's proposal to protect this, which would connect the Okefenokee and the Osceola, was very controversial also because the Pinhook Swamp was mostly logged over private timberland. But eventually, Larry's arguments started to get, to get some, some um, say at various uh, venues, and the Nature Conservancy began buying land, and today we have a largely intact corridor between Okefenokee and Osceola to the benefit of the Florida black bear and other species that require these compromised but otherwise very important connections. And so what's happened over so much of um, our landscapes of the world and really is the impetus for these large landscape designs in many cases is that populations of wide-ranging species have become fragmented. So the Florida black bear, for instance, originally occurred throughout the state of Florida except for the most extensive treeless landscapes like the Everglades, Everglades proper. Um, today it's limited to these um, fragmented patches like you see here. So the idea of the connectivity is to try to bring these together so we can have a long-term viable population or metapopulation. So eventually, actually against Larry Harris's advice because he was worried about backlash, I came, I came up with this proposal for a statewide network, which um, I first published this actually besides, besides in the Earth First Journal. <laughs> I first published it in the Naturaries Journal uh, back in 1987. But, um, it was perceived at the time as a little bit, kind of like my Florida proposal and Larry Harris's Pinnock Swamp, as something totally unrealistic, not doable. But to my surprise, to everyone's surprise perhaps, within a few years, the state agencies and the Nature Conservancy had refined this proposal and were already using it to prioritize lands for acquisition by the state of Florida. And so this ultimately became the Florida Ecological Greenways Network. Now, this network isn't all in place now. It's back, only those dark green are existing conservation lands. The rest is simply a proposal, which is prioritized there from P1 through P5. But in any case, um, this, until quite recently, did a lot of good to help protect land in Florida. And Florida spent more money, over $300 million annually, protecting land than probably anywhere in the world. And it worked, at least in, in terms of its intended purposes. Um, this is um, an example. A Florida panther was radio collared down in the um, Big Cypress. And if you can follow the little lines with arrows, it found its way northward. It spent almost a year in the Nature Conservancy's Disney Wilderness Preserve, which is not far from Disney World. It couldn't find a mate, so it headed back home. And eventually, its, its batteries uh, went dead on its collar um, near where it came from. The latest vision for a connected Florida landscape is called the Florida Wildlife Corridor. And it, um, this slide kind of suggests it's maybe ended, but it started in 2012 and it's ongoing, but this is a 2017 version of the map. And this is essentially a simplified version of the Florida Ecological Greenways Network. Unfortunately, it leaves out a lot. And over the years, I started to get increasingly nervous and frankly feeling increasingly guilty about these large landscape plans because they were leaving out so much. And though I have yet to quantify this, I know for a fact that the vast majority of locations of narrow endemic species and natural communities are totally missing from this Florida Wildlife Corridor. And I think that's a problem. It's a problem especially because almost all of the environmental groups in Florida have put completion of the Florida Wildlife Corridor as their highest priority. So what are we missing? Well, Florida has a lot of endemics, and a lot of them, as I mentioned, occur outside this corridor. For example, in coastal locations. This is one of my favorites. Um, it occurs in just three counties, as you see here. Uh, it occurs often on old Indian shell middens that were built up by pre-Columbian Indian groups in Florida, um, it would not be protected by these large landscape schemes. This is just one example. There's many others. If we look at our springs, 
our caves, other subterranean systems, these for the most part are also outside the Florida Wildlife Corridor. So we have species such as the, um, I guess the, the uh, pointer doesn't work, but we have that spring run spider lily, which is not highly endangered, but it's a southeastern endemic, it only occurs in springs. And when we have some very um, highly endemic taxa like the Orlando spider cave crayfish known from one site, the Georgia blind salamander known from very few sites on the Georgia uh, Florida border. These would be missed by these large scale landscape conservation plans. Any place that has very high endemism requires a multifaceted strategy. It can't rely on something as simplistic as a Florida wildlife corridor or anything along those lines, including my early maps. They would not have cut it. Um, this is a map showing the ranges overlaid of narrow range species endemics in the southeast. And these are defined in this particular study by Estelle and Cruzan as species that are confined to 25 or fewer counties over their range. And you can see the concentration of endemics in Florida. And if we look closely just at Florida, we can see precisely where those hot spots are. Um, the Panhandle, the central spine of the state, particularly the Lake of Wales Ridge, the southern part, and perhaps surprisingly coastal areas. Surprising because of the many sea level fluctuations we've had in Florida. Um, the Atlantic Coastal Ridge, um, to a lesser extent along the Gulf Coast, the Miami Rock Ridge, and the Florida Keys. That's where most of our narrow endemic taxa are found. We've done a pretty good job of protecting land, as I alluded to earlier in Florida. We spent a lot of money for over three decades in protecting lands. Because of this, we have 10.5 million acres of conservation land, some 30% of the state of Florida. Now, I hasten to add, these are not all strict protected areas. These include multiple use lands such as state forests, national forests, and military installations. However, these multiple use semi-natural landscapes are doing a pretty good job of protecting biodiversity if we can keep them managed well. And that's really the key caveat. Uh, this is an example of a military land. This is Avon Park Air Force Range down in south central Florida along the Kissimmee River. Um, these lands are not all semi-natural habitats. This is a beautiful miles-long seepage slope complex with a number of endemic species. In fact, that yellow flower you see there is a endemic to central Florida, Polygala rugoei. And right across the river from Avon Park, we have one of um, Florida's largest state-managed areas, Kissimmee Prairie Preserve State Park, nearly 60,000 acres, the largest expanse of uh, subtropical hyperseasonal grassland, better known as Florida Dry Prairie, which is something of a misnomer because it's seasonally inundated. But is this enough? We have all this conservation land, yet species such as our only full endemic species of bird, the Florida scrub jay, are declining increasingly precipitously because a lot of their land is outside existing conservation areas. So our governor and legislature say that we already have too much conservation land. So our land acquisition has essentially stopped. Um, I and almost every biologist I know in the state of Florida say that because of the problems we're experiencing and the many unprotected populations of endemic taxa and so on, we need a lot more protected area. And this is really the big driver and the, of the urgency of this increased need for conservation. Our governor is encouraging people in hordes to move into Florida. Um, he's actually bribing companies to the tunes of millions of dollars to relocate to Florida and bring people with them. Uh, we have now 20, almost 21 million people in Florida, third most populous state. We added over 367,000 people in 2016. And this is after subtracting out migration and deaths. So this is the net growth. And we have over 100 million tourists annually. So on a daily basis, I can drive from my home to my former campus and see new habitat being destroyed on a daily basis. And it's extremely sad. Where are those people? Well, um, both historically and, and still now, they're distributed largely along the coasts, which as you recall, is, which is where we have a lot of our endemics. They're down the central spine of the state, another high endemic area. And they're in this, uh, pernicious Orlando to Tampa I-4 corridor, which is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. We have an additional problem, a problem that has been identified as early as the 1950s in a journal article by the eminent ecologist Frank Egler. 
sea level rise. The effects of sea level rise have been documented in Florida since the 1950s. This isn't some hypothetical future scenario. It's happening now. And increasingly, we see the signs, not just on human communities and infrastructure, but on natural communities. And some colleagues and I did a study a few years ago. We found over 300 species in Florida are vulnerable to the combined impacts of land use change, especially increased urbanization and sea level rise. Basically, as my mentor Larry Harris said, they're caught between the devil and the deep blue sea. The devil being urbanization and the deep blue sea, which is rising. This is just a sampling of those species that are at risk. But away from the coast, we have small, isolated communities known from nowhere else on Earth, such as this G1S1 community, Florida Upland Glade. A very strange community. Floristically, it's most similar to the Blackland prairies of further north and west in the south. It, it doesn't yet have any described narrow endemic species exclusively found within it, but a couple are being described. But it has a lot of disjunct species that are way outside their normal range. An example is this one, uh, barren silky aster, which is, occurs further north um, across the southeast in calcareous grasslands, glades, and barrens. It, it is known from only two sites in Florida within one county, within these upland glades. Yet these glades are unprotected. Okay, this, um, this was the highest quality glade you see right here. Um, it's owned by a, a landowner who ha has an adjacent quarry, and even though he vowed to protect these sites voluntarily, um, after we saw this, uh, my colleague who knows him went to him and said, oh, it's just some of the boys joyriding in the bulldozers. So basically, he destroyed most of the highest quality glade in just one afternoon. So I hate to say, voluntary conservation doesn't necessarily work. You've got to have a legal mechanism, at least a conservation easement, to protect these lands. And unfortunately, neither the state, the Nature Conservancy, or the land trusts are no longer interested in these small, isolated areas in Florida. They're all kind of jumped on the big landscape bandwagon. And there's another reason, of course, why we need areas both large and small, near and even inside urban areas. People need to have nature close at hand. And many talks here this year and every year have emphasized this. People need natural areas to maintain their sanity. I know to maintain what's left of my sanity, <laughs> I need places like Mills Creek, which I call my personal Walden because it's 1.4 miles from my house, which is the same distance that Walden Pond was from Henry David Thoreau's home in Concord, Massachusetts. And I go here regularly, and it helps. But there's also um, millions of acres, actually, in Florida of these very large ranches. Florida was the original cowboy state, and we still have a very active livestock industry. And these semi-natural landscapes are incredibly important. And it's, it's crucial that we keep these as working ranches rather than allowing them to be turned into cities. And what's happening now, the big theme in Florida is developers come in and they create these new cities out in the middle of nowhere. And just recently, a new city of half a million people was approved. Um, it's being put forward by the Mormon Church, which, or, which owns, um, it's the largest private landowner in Florida. And they plan to develop virtually all of their land. They're getting out of the cattle business, pretty much, going into urban development. But there are species, curiously, that actually prefer these semi-natural grasslands to our native grasslands, which seems odd, but these are species that are associated with more closely cropped short grasses, such as exotic bahia grass, Pespalum notatum, that the ranchers have planted. Um, examples here, shown here, are the crested caracara, uh, the Florida burrowing owl. These are um, populations in Florida that are disjunct from the western United States and southward and northward in some cases. Um, the Florida Sandhill Crane also prefers these semi-natural uh, grasslands on ranches to our native grasslands. So again, we need these small natural areas protected like Florida upland glades as well as these large semi-natural landscapes. So to conclude, um, even in Florida, a state where we have accomplished so much for conservation, uh, we're starting to lose ground. Uh, significant gaps remain. We can't rest on our laurels. A lot of people say, well, we've done a great job. You know, it's just a question now of management. Now, management is key. Don't get me wrong. But if we want to prevent a huge wave of extinctions within the coming decades, we have to start acquiring more land and getting more conservation easements on private land to do it right. 
And I, please don't take this message as a bummer. Um, look at this as an opportunity. Our jobs are not done. We have so much more to do, not just in Florida, but in all the states and elsewhere where you all live. So we need to get going and continue the good work. Thanks very much.